Let's start with two blood tests that I think are some of the most important that you can do that are very rarely done by mainstream physicians. This is the fasting insulin and the prolactin. And as you can see here, I am a 45 year old male. I was born June 29th, 1977. That's me. <laughs> this is my blood work. So my insulin, my fasting insulin was 3.2 micro IU per ml uh, on this blood work, which was in mid-March, 2023. And my prolactin was 10.5. Now for context, usually almost every single time that I've done fasting insulin, it's right around three micro IU per ml or lower. But I did have previous blood work on the 6th of March, which is why I repeated this one, where I had a 5.8 out of nowhere. So I don't know why my fasting insulin was up on the 6th of March. I don't really vary my diet that much. But this is just to say that if your blood work looks a little funny, just repeat it. Sometimes things are strange in what we're doing. The body is complex and we can't always go based on one snapshot. I'll talk about that with regard to lipids later in this podcast as well. So this is a outlying value for me, a 5.8. Is it a lab error? Was I just more tired? I was traveling for all of this blood work. So it's influenced by that. I'm not sleeping in the same bed that I'm used to in Costa Rica, which is where I spend most of my time. And I'm frankly not my best self when I'm traveling because I'm not in my space. I'm exposed to lights at night, my circadian rhythm is off and moving across time zones. So take that into consideration when we're looking at these labs. But regardless, um, one of these fasting insulin levels was not horrible. 5.8 is not horrible, but if somebody came to me with a fasting insulin of 5.8, I'd say, well, it's a little higher than I'd like to see it. So I repeated it 3.2, which is more like what I'm used to seeing. You'll see here my prolactin was 11.8 on the 6th of March. Again, I think that on the 6th of March, I just really hadn't slept well the night before. Prolactin tends to be a little bit elevated when you haven't slept well, when you are fatigued. And even this 10.5 um, from this mid-March blood work, so I got blood work on the 6th of March and probably on the 15th or something of March. And this 10.5 for prolactin is also high for me. I've had prolactins in the sevens before, which is probably more of my normal. Why do I care about prolactin? Prolactin is important when you're thinking about dopamine and when you're thinking about testosterone. I had a friend recently who sent me his blood work and his prolactin was 34. And I thought, you need to work that up. You need to look and see if you have a little adenoma in your brain. That's not a normal level of prolactin in the human body, especially for a male or any woman who is not breastfeeding. So prolactin is something that can interfere with sex drive, with erectile function, with weight loss, with libido, all of these things. And so you want to know what your prolactin is and it should kind of track with metabolic health. The thing to know about prolactin also is that it is elevated after an orgasm. So if you've had sex or an orgasm the night before you get your blood work, it might be a little higher, but in metabolically healthy males specifically, there should be a quick return to baseline of prolactin after orgasm. I imagine it's the same for women. Um, we can look into that data on a future podcast as well. So start your blood work with a fasting insulin and a prolactin. Make sure you get those two. Know what levels are normal for you. You definitely want your prolactin, I would say, less than 15, which is the reference interval. And I would say probably less than 10. And understand, like I said, that if you are very tired, fatigued, or had sex right before this test, it might not be a totally accurate measure of things. But if your prolactin is in the 30s or in the 20s or in the high teens, something is off there and you need to dig into that. And if your insulin is really much above four or five, then you need to think about what is causing insulin resistance. And a theme throughout this podcast on blood work, and as I talk about blood work in general, and health of humans in general, will be that there is no greater metric to understand than your insulin sensitivity. And I think there is no better test than fasting insulin. I simply do not understand why more physicians do not order fasting insulin, probably because as doctors, we are taught only really to think about that test in the setting of type one diabetes. But this as I've said before, and I will say again, I think if more people ordered fasting insulin, if more physicians ordered fasting insulin, more nurse practitioners, more PAs, and more patients were empowered to ask their physicians for fasting insulin, it would change the face of medicine because we would see how many people have elevated fasting insulin. They have subclinical insulin resistance, subclinical metabolic dysfunction, and then you can start taking action on that. I'll talk in this podcast about what you can do to take action regarding that. Cliff notes, it doesn't have to do with removing sugar from your diet in the form of fruit and honey. I think that's actually not a problem for humans, though that's a controversial view. I've spoken about it in the past. Last week's podcast with Georgie had some information about that as well. The major thing I think you need to do, the two major things you need to do if you have an elevated fasting insulin is think about 
your baseline cortisol levels, and I'll show you my cortisol to DHEA in one moment. Uh, and what is raising your cortisol? Is it leaky gut? Is it gut inflammation causing cortisol to be elevated because of this fragment of gram-negative bacteria called lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin that's moving into your body? And limit your consumption, your intake of omega-6 primarily, but also don't overdo omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. I think those are the two main drivers of insulin resistance in humans. So you want to know what your cortisol is, and let's go to that. So you can see here from, this is from March the 6th, blood work, my morning cortisol was 15.8. Again, previously my morning cortisol was 10.0. This is probably some indication of poor sleep as I'm traveling, but my DHEAS is 126 and previously 139 micrograms per deciliter. So this ratio, cortisol to DHEAS, is perhaps the single easiest but also most powerful ratio to assess how stressed you are and to potentially assess your longevity or the trajectory that you are headed toward in your longevity. What do you want this ratio to be? Less than 0 0.3. You can see that even in my stressed state with poor sleep, my ratio is 0.124. So I'm not in a bad spot. And the ratio was even lower when I was perhaps a little better slept in November, 10 over 139. Both of these are the same units, micrograms per deciliter. So understand what your cortisol is. Get an AM cortisol. These are both AM fasting cortisols. And if you are really interested in knowing where your cortisol level is, get it throughout the day because understanding your cortisol will give you many insights into your overall health and could help you unravel, untangle what is causing both non-alcoholic fatty liver disease to foreshadow something I'll talk about later in this podcast and your overall stress and insulin resistance. So again, let's repeat this. If your fasting insulin is elevated, limit polyunsaturated fatty acids, that is seed oils, corn, canola, sunflower, safflower, grapeseed. I've talked about this tons on previous podcasts and on my social media and manage your cortisol. Get that as low as possible. Is it stress reduction? Is it improving your sleep quality? Whatever you need to do, think about what's raising your cortisol. Is it damage to your gut causing, again, endotoxin, this fragment of gram-negative bacterial cell walls? When the gram-negative bacteria proliferate in the colon, this seems to happen. Talked about with Georgie last week. 